welcome to another broadcast of The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available in podcast form. You can pick them up at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions and comments to DJ at artistfirst.com. And here's a couple of great souls, Michael and Margaret Lyons. <laughs> oh, what a great segue. Thank you very much, Scott. And um, our souls are not sketchy. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That's just a little inside baseball. Anyway, um, so... Uh, uh, yeah, um, He's no, no, Michael. I'm Michael. I'm Margaret. And um, my soul is just okay. <laughs> Are you, you know, ready for this? No, we're just silly tonight. I'm silly tonight, but um, I'm silly and not Michael. But uh, tonight we will not be silly. Tonight we are going to talk about uh, souls. One of the things we're going to talk about is souls tonight. Yeah, me too. But we're going to talk about a lot of other things too. But I think I'm, I'm going to say that let's launch right into Now this is the second soul of the every man in a row uh, where we are... Um, Using a, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, unbeknown, unbeknownst to us at the time. But uh, Eleanor obviously was just a pithy dudette. <laughs> but yeah, yes, she was. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, we're going to go with it. And um, if you would read said quote, if you have it in front of you, yeah. and then we will try to uh, we will try to launch right off the bat. All right. Um... Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Hmm. Yeah, and and Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, what what we took away from that, although the obvious is is is, is of course right in front of you, in, in that um, you know the the idea of 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 uh, of greatness being associated with with sort of a higher plane, sort of an ivory tower, is something that I think comes from the uh, late nineteenth, uh, early early twentieth century, um, sort of looking at at uh, intellectualism mm-hmm. as as the ideal. And I'm not so sure that 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 was the ideal or that it should be the ideal. Certainly, there's there's good things to be said about all things because if you have this and just say we have ideas, events, and people, all those things, ideas, events, and people are all in many ways worthy of discussion. Uh, right. certain, certainly people are, are incredibly important. Uh, but I think when Eleanor's talking about discussing people, we're really talking about like gossiping about them or just, you know, talking about the little events of our lives uh, versus what she's uh, sort of espousing that the ideas, this sort of ivory tower uh, higher plane, uh, you know, sort of philosophical look at life. But I, I, what I took away, what we took away from that was uh, something a little bit different. So um, we we say that, you know, we're going to put this up on the website, but the great minds are, are associated with, with great souls, with great spirits, with with profound consciousnesses, which is very hard to say. Um, consciousnesses. Uh, however... <laughs> The, the, the difference between great and average and small is perspective. And I think what what Eleanor is talking about here really boils down to perspective. Yeah. Um, it, and it's perspective on all these three things. You can have ideas which are small and mean, and you can have ideas which are which are great and vast and have uh, you know which which require a certain amount of appreciation to to wrap your head around. Similarly, there can be events which are quite mundane and those which are earth shattering and 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 worthy of of, uh, of much discussion and people. Also, you know, the degree to which people are are relevant to you, to your life, not not this artificial sort of, of uh, this person is great and this person isn't, or this person's famous and this person isn't. This, this these are the you know these are the the People magazine way of looking at people, but but in fact, the significance of everybody's life and its unique. Um, uh, you know, its unique value uh, is it, certainly something which does, which not only um, 
engenders discussion, but it engenders an internal dialogue, a, a continuous uh, seeking, uh, a continuous um, uh, processing of experience, so that people, you know, in the in the in the in the pyramid of events, uh, in the pyramid of of of, uh, of, uh, of existence. People are are very worthy of discussion, um, you know, from that point of view. But I think her her take is is still not incorrect um, because it is perspective. If you focus on ideas which are, um, uh, I'll 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 use the term mean, but I what I mean by it is small. Sm- is small. Uh, you know the the uh, the ideas that you're really talking about are are thoughts about the very mundane or the or thoughts about the very um, uh, banal. You know uh, these these are still ideas. There's still things that that people will spend some time uh, talking about, and maybe from the point of view of of how much they occupy you. Your person, you know, t- totally would say that 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 our constant internal mental dialogue, you know, the mental is the is the is the um, the province of ideas. So that constant internal, you know, this and then that and then the next thing and then I got to do this and then I got to do this and then I got to do this. That's the that's that's not the great minds discussing ideas. That's that's the the, the mind um, droning on to itself and talking to itself constantly about very tiny things, you know. Okay. So that perspective is is moving. You know, you, when you're when you're talking about perspective on an idea, it's really um, synthesizing something, making an abstraction, bringing something up into more of a uh, of uh, of of a of a higher you and by higher, I don't mean that it's greater. I mean that it's, 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 it's more all-encompassing. You look at you look at at what is what has been presented to you and say, how can I connect this to so many other things? Where's the commonalities? Let's right. say, right, right. Um, you know, those are the, so each one of these things can be made great. Right. Um, the perspective uh, is really the key in the statement because what she's saying is small minds discuss people and you think of the field that that entails it's just it's I and talking about people yeah. average minds discuss events which broadens your field again into what is happening around you or a much broader field which is throughout a a world right okay and then the great minds discuss ideas which basically is talking about noticing underlying tendencies or patterns or what we would say um would be laws uh, like in physics you have the law of, laws of uh, gravity or um, thermodynamics but anyway um, it's being able to bring your perspective into a much larger field that you're interacting with and when I say interacting it's from the point of observation and thinking that and that's the truth of it it's thinking about it looking at it that way um, but what brings you to a point where a great mind becomes a great soul mm. and because we, we know many intelligent people um, and people automatically want, when you're thinking in these terms, they want to say, oh, well, is this a small or is this a, an average or is this a great kind of thing? And you, it, it automatically gives you this... Um, Hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And 
that is the nature of the mind to try to order things that way. Now, the next step, of course, is when people begin to equate their worth according to this hierarchy. Mm. And that is incorrect because it just means that um, there are skill sets that you're looking at um, that are considered uh, strong, a stronger skill set in the intelligence quotient. But there is more to life than just pure intelligence. Mm. Okay, especially for a human, you're more than just what you're thinking. We keep saying this. Um, you have something called an emotional quotient, if you do that, where uh, that, frankly, is the foundation of people's relationships mm. one to the other. As opposed to IQ, is this EQ? They call it, they call it, they literally do call it EQ. Okay. But to understand that you, when that understanding is there, because if you have only uh, a concentration on IQ or only a concentration on EQ, you are only exploring part of who you actually are. Mm. So what makes a great soul? That is expanding all of that uh, encompass who you actually are. So, in other words, uh, because, the, you know, the, the typical um, archetype character of, of an intellectual would be someone who's uh, very good in, like, science or math or, or even working some of uh, the art forms. Mm. But having trouble making a connection to another human being. Right, that's the stereotype. So, then you have the other end where your emotional quotient is very high. And these people are able to make all these connections with other people because they meet them on the emotional level. Right. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're in a true friendship but they're able to make the connect that way. Right. Being able to bring those two skill sets together, expand yourself outside those concentric rings of people, events, and concepts. That is the beginnings of a great soul. Yeah. And I... Uh, I would say that <clears throat> the the foundation of a great soul, if we talk about a great soul being, um, you know, really someone who's in touch with true existence, with being, with the being state, uh, is is to raise your perspective. Um, you know, Tolle, I, I, we go back to Tolle a lot because Tolle has really nailed this in many ways, but Tolle's whole uh, shtick, if you will, it, well, his whole thing, his his whole, it really boils down to one thing: is is that you you expand your perspective on all things into consciousness. You you really look at everything and and feel its presence. You feel your own presence. You feel the presence of your body. You feel the presence of the world. You, you, what is that? What is that at its root? It, it, other than in essence, connecting to a higher or a greater or a vaster perspective. You, you, you don't concentrate on the, the voice in your head. And, and I'll say that I think as we do, as all of us do as human beings, we want a mechanistic way to get to what we want. We want a mechanistic way to become enlightened, for argument's sake. We want the seven steps. So people say, "Well, I'm, I, you know, I, 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 the little voice in my head is still there. I must not be enlightened." It has, and it, the, as you go into it more and more, you realize that none of that matters. You can have all the connection to all the tiniest of finest of details and be incredibly involved in what appears to be the minutia of life, and yet always have the perspective that this is just what I'm doing now. Once you 
understand that the perspective of the being state encompasses all things, down to the tiniest minutiae, down to every thought, down to all the expressions, all the experiences, that you don't let yourself be bound up in these things and to, to, to uh, in essence, um, restrict yourself to them and say, this is who I am. You, you say, the, the I am, the being, includes all of these things and that you sit there and allow the consciousness to that perspective that's where you sit you sit i don't know if, if this is the right analogy but on you know on the petals of the lotus or whatever it is you're 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 up there in the being state and yet every part of you is alive every part of you is allowed to do all the tiny things all the the thought things all the but as with each moment of now you're like ah oh, uh, i'm just there I'm, I'm in touch with the fact that i'm here that i am right well you abide so, you abide in in the consciousness you abide and 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 abiding is the perspective that you have that's where you get to the great soul when you just abide mm -hmm. when you at that point uh, everything has fallen into place. There's no striving with yourself or trying to reason things out. It's pure observation and peace because you are um, participating in that moment and really not interfering with your own experience of being. You're not getting in your own way. Mm -hmm. You're not... You're not bringing forth emotion because you're more comfortable with an, emo an emotion than you are with just being still or being in a thought or uh, a task driven mode where I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I gotta check this and I, Could that. I stop you for a second? Shh. Because that's I, I, what you just said there I think is so profound we tell ourselves that we're more comfortable in this whatever it is, the minutia so we we tell ourselves when we're comfortable in the, and you can you can if you think about it for a second you can hear yourself telling yourself oh I'm more comfortable with with the mechanical or with the electrical or with the the physics or I'm more comfortable with the emotions, so it's all you telling you what you're comfortable with. And comfortable is such that it's really the key of the limitations because we we tell ourselves. <laughs> The old phrase is, you made your bed, now lie in it. Well, you're both making your bed and sticking yourself in it. True. Yes. Yeah, just like Kitty. Yeah, you're, you're just so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. We're on the radio, Cat. <laughs> Go ahead. When you... <laughs> Love this cat. She is... When you are in that mode of being, there's no requirement. And that's what makes the mind crazy. Because suddenly there's no requirement that it needs to meet. And if you're accustomed to fulfilling these demands, uh, you are very uncomfortable with yourself at that point might even say you are addicted mm. to that answering of demands because you feel like you're, this is your reason to be alive. I have to answer this demand. Right. Instead of just being because you don't need a reason to be. Uh, again, you profoundly, you know, the addiction of thought and the addiction of emotion are, are these two things uh, you, you can see it in Eleanor's uh, statement here you know when you're talking about the average minds they're addicted to discussing events to reacting to events to be oh this and that and, you know, just this all this, this this and you know when they're talking about discussing people really addicted to um, the minutiae right 
addicted to the minutia of of everyday life and who's and who's doing what to who and and who said what to what and why and I thought this and they thought that and then they thought and then they said this and then I said that and then I did this and then I did that you know that's 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 that you know that's what she's saying in essence is the addiction to this um you know this sort of mental or really it's in mental emotional in that in that regard but it doesn't matter it's just this addiction to the this constant oh i'll do this and i'll do that and then she said and they did this because they do this, and they always do this and they always do that and i they're doing this and i'm going to do that later and blah, blah, blah. you know that whole uh, litany or or um it's really almost a uh uh one of the reasons why soap operas were always so popular soap opera exactly because people they needed their their hit of uh this and that and what's going on mm-hmm. drama i mean literally daytime drama as they Day- termed it daytime drama yeah but um understanding you sit there and you go well why why do I need to know about this at all? And let's face it, when if, if ever you've uh, been into any of those daytime dramas, you can drop it for like a couple of years and come back and pick up exactly where you left off. Right. There's There's nothing about it that isn't repeated endlessly but that's the comforting yes, part of it but that that's what i find fascinating it's the same story over and over again maybe the characters change or the the people have grown older but it's the same thing and what are you satisfying at that point because you you're basically answering a, an internal craving that you're having mm. what is this craving yeah I, I think it's it's a a diminution or, or a substitution uh, for this idea of being um, of having a purpose. Your, your your purpose becomes almost listening to listening to and reacting to, listening to and reacting to, listening to and reacting to. I, th- I think it goes back to the EQ, the emotion, the emotional quotient, because. need to have a certain amount of interaction with another human being. We are. This is our nature. Yes. Okay. And when you don't get it on an everyday basis, you feel this hole. Right. And I believe that watching somebody else, even if it's a story being told to you, seems to satisfy this craving or fill this hole for a short period of time, yes. but it ne- it never fills it completely. Right. And and that's the realization you've got to come to. It's like, well, I have this hole in me that needs to be filled. What what can I do to fill it? And people use different things in their lives, trying to fill it. You know, the typical example is. You know, you're chasing after money, but suddenly you get to the point where money is not a problem, but you're still empty. Right. You haven't filled. You still haven't filled that hole. Or the the uh, having a high IQ means that you've always used your intellect to try to satisfy that hole. But even after you've discovered incredible theories, you can still be empty. Yeah. Uh, well, to go back to experience, you know, to the the, the drama quotient, the EQ, it's vicarious in the same way that uh, you know when people like the IQ, it's all accomplishment. I got this degree. I did this thing. I discovered that thing. You mentioned theories, whatever. The, and so you're you're striving for accomplishment, but accomplishment doesn't fulfill. For the other one, you're disc- you're you're, you're uh, striving for experience, for 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 novel, uh, for something new. You know, when people go deeply into pornography or they go deeply into all these other types of things, they're really looking for something new. But yet, it's always the same thing over and over. Drugs, same thing over and over and over again. It never fulfills, but yet it's this always constant striving for the for experience to fill fulfill. 
and the other one is for achievement to fulfill. And all of it, it what it is, is is the mind trying endlessly to fulfill itself, or the or the uh, the corporeal trying endlessly to fulfill itself, whether it's emotional or through gluttony or through uh, um, sex or through drugs or whatever it is. But these endless sort of living there, living down there, um, if you will, or living at that energy or frequency level belies the consciousness. Uh, and to the extent that these things are antithetical to each other, where the mind sort of eschews the body or the body eschews the mind or the well, EQ. Then, but, right? that's, but that's another um, story that you wind up telling yourself. Yes. You know, you, you split yourself in two saying, well, my emotions are fighting with my intellect or my <laughs> intellect is fighting with my emotions. And, you know, and you're saying, but that's all you. It's all you. Why uh, are you fighting with yourself? We're, we're, I'm reminded, and you probably are saying it for the same reason, where Tolle was saying, well, who, who's the you and who's the I in this, in this statement? You know, I won't let myself do this. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because that's exactly what we do to ourselves. Yes. We have a tendency to want to say, okay, this is my emotional part and this is my uh, logical thought process and this is my body experience and, you know, it's... Quantify, quantify, quantify. And, and you sit there and you go, well, doing that, why are you drawing borders up? within yourself when you should actually be drawing borders up around you completely from the things that aren't you, the outside world that wants to tell you what you are. I mean, this it's the, it's the groundwork or the... It sets groundwork down so that you're so confused that you'll take anything coming your way to try to figure it out. Right. I mean, human beings, because of because of the power that we have of the mind and of the abstraction, we tend to um, very deliberately uh, separate ourselves into pieces. And, and, and to a large extent, that does help. Uh, you know, it, when you start to discern, which is really all it is, when you start your to the level that you can discern and make distinctions and make judgments and all those sort of, sort of things, is a tremendous power of the mind, a tremendous power of of what we are, you know, in our ability to navigate through this this experience down here. But when you turn that power inward and start to divide yourself into pieces, uh, compartmentalize you run the grave risk of identifying with those pieces, one perhaps more than the other. And that's where the comfort comes in. Oh, I'm, I'm much more comfortable. Everyone tells me I'm so good at this, and I'm much more comfortable doing it. So that's what I am. I, now I'm this. I'm completely 100% uh, you know, the, the ivory tower intellectual. But that means I can't do any of those emotional things, and I don't take any care of my body. And I just, you know, it's, I, I've just totally focused on this and i and i i am not that i i oh, almost yeah you know, exactly that's that is what you're trained to well you you know i'm trying to find out who i am right you're sitting here going you can't exclude your experience down here to identify solely with one thing is to is closing the doors on real exploration of who you actually are. Hmm. You have to open mind about yourself. Well, and there, there, and there it is. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's take that thought into the break because we're we're just about at the at the midpoint here. So we're going to take an open mind into the break, and we're going to come back on the other side and talk about uh, great ideas.
Thor Dan fans. Love mythology with plenty of action and humor? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe, and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel, It's in the Blood, available for a limited time. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back. And the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack, and time is definitely not on their side, as they battle against their enemies' undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him, or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book One, Destroyer's Blood, and the new release, Book Two, First Blood, today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e tailers. Hi, this is Hannah Ruth from the band Wild Hum. Check out our new Americana Soul CD, Wild Hum, at our website, W I L D H U M music.com. And you are listening to the Artist First Radio Network. Thank you. There is a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read, just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, the fat man gets out of bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. Thank you for joining us on The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. Back to your co-hosts, Michael and Margaret Lines. Right. And, and we're back from our break and only great souls this half hour <laughs> no we'll let anybody in um, I, but we are talking tonight um, about a quote uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt and I think though that we've we've um, found the nub of it I think that the nub of, of this quote really is talking about perspective and from the point of view of 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 all of us here dreaming the common dream uh, one thing humans have our superpower is our ability to modify our perspective and by that I mean is that you can choose to concentrate on whatever you want to concentrate on or you can choose to to expand your perspective and expand your consciousness um, pull back get a get it's usually called I'll get the 30,000 foot view on something I I have a vision I can see all around me I have you know I I, I, I mean, have the ability to abstract and pull back well all of us have the ability to move up and down this um, 
it's really more like a tree of perspective. You can be down in the in the roots in the minutia. You can be moving up into the into the heights into the stratosphere. Um, but the key with all of it is to realize that you are not where you're currently looking, and you are not what is currently happening, and you're not what you're thinking about. Okay, those are the things that Eleanor has divided up here. You know, into uh, ideas and events and, and people. Where you're currently looking or who you're currently interacting with is not who you are. And, and what's happening around you, you know, don't let events, people say don't let events define you, right? What's happening around you is not you. And, and, and even what you've done or what is the consequences of your actions are also not you. Nor are all the lofty thoughts or all the things you think about or all the little, you know, I've got to pay my bill and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. That's not you. The you, the you, the being, the great soul, the spirit, encompasses it all. All of it. You just are. And I think it almost, Margaret, it becomes too obvious a thing for everybody. You know, I can't just be. What, what, what good is that? you got to do something. Just, yes, you could do something, but you still have to be first. <laughs> and they're like, no! <laughs> I don't want to be! I want to do! <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a child. <laughs> they're, as an infant, they're just, they're just lying there. And they want to desperately move around and get up. You know, that's that's where you that's when the impulse begins. But as you mature, if you can understand that there is a a balance point between just being and doing, because children are, and that's it. I have to stop you again because that's so so profound. We are born as beings, and then we're almost told immediately, do something. <laughs> I don't you do something. Or or internally you say, I gotta do something. Everyone else is doing things. I can't just be here. But yet we are born as beings. And we and by the way, we all leave this earth, leave this existence as beings. As you you die and we can talk about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but as you die you go back into being state on your way out. You can do nothing. But you be learning but that uh, understanding as a child you you are in that being state naturally Hmm. and that's when you begin to form uh, the mind aspect and having a balanced form is something that most families do not to their children you know it's a a very rare um, very rare person that understands that you know you're here to experience what life has in store but the as a parent you, you feel responsible we're trying to get your kid, you know, like, well, we got to get you on track with something here. You mm-hmm. Try to make you, give you some skill sets, something, okay? And, and it is natural, but losing perspective is the problem. Mm-hmm. Because you begin to, we all have known parents that tie their identity up with their children. Oh. And and do not allow them to be who they are. Um, Whole societies do this. Yep. Where they say, well, the children are supposed to do this. And um, they're too young to know better. So you you have to tell them what they have to do. And then that's where the rigidity comes in, especially when it comes to control or controlling. And and don't, doesn't, Every one of us rebel against that at a basic level. Yes. Because because we know that it's not correct. Mm-hmm. We're born free, and that freedom is very dear to us. And when it's curtailed in any way, um, 
there's a part of you, the outcry from your heart is like, no. 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 E- even if you don't have the words for it, you, you know at a visceral level, at a, at, a, at, a, at a being level, that you have to be free. Right. And the idea, for, as a parent, you have to have to bring your children to a point of civility, let's face it. You know, when they're little, they're, you know, just a little bit above animal. <laughs> they're doing whatever they want to do. Yeah. They, 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 until they learn that, that this is where uh, this would be good and this is not good, they will do things um, that is just not good for them. Eating things they shouldn't eat. Um, tearing things apart that don't need to be torn apart, flushing things down the toilet that shouldn't be flushed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, oddly specific examples, but moving on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, showing them that they have a place within the family, but you're you as a parent, you're walking that line between what you can allow them to do in terms of, well, okay, you're exploring, trying to trying to see how free it can be, and, and like, this is going to kill you if you do this. Don't do that. <laughs> but, but this is very interesting, because a parent saying this is going to kill you, the, 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 the best, not the best, the, the ultimate... Uh, arbiter of what will kill you or not is reality. Mm-hmm. But yet, because we are beings uh, in this state and we have knowledge and we have experience and we have uh, prior experience to look into, we we tend to um, organize and and provide a a uh, a roadmap. But but again, that that whole idea can become toxic. You know, this, mm-hmm. you, roadmaps can become uh, chains. Uh, uh, they can become prison walls. Yeah, like, uh, our, fam- like a, a, our family always does it this way. Right, you know, or, or a maze that you have to run through that there's no freedom whatsoever. So so it's, it is a very fine line because you don't, you want to say to someone who has no experience that, that that's not a good idea. You know, they're, whether they're your children or whomever they may be, and the, the the question will come back, and this is the most natural question: Why? Mm-hmm. And and where you provide the the answer to why is where you provide the uh, the 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 reasoning, but you also you also show them two things. If you do that, this is where this is the kind of the if you do the why correctly. The why is not because. Right. The why is. Well, you know, these are the repercussions. The, right here, here's here's why, and why, in essence, has to make sense. Why is is an interrogative that that is looking for a a reasoning? And when you reason, uh, there are occasions where reason fails, and you have to just say no. But there are occasions, and as you develop a young being into a more mature being to the extent that you can provide them reasoning underpinnings for what what is or what is going to provide them or may provide them a certain measure of success and comfort versus what may not but at the end of the day you have to say those were the reasons we had then and they seemed to work then but you still have to figure out both the, both what you want to do and if you feel that you want to take the risk. So what you're doing is you're educating rather than restricting and then you say but it's up to you. And you have to say that in the best and with the best heart. You have to say it in the way that it's not well go right ahead. I don't care. You know, that's not the Oh way yeah, to say. The, I'm waiting for the I told you so. Yeah, I told you so. No. What you have to say is uh, I, I I this is this is why. This is how. This is what's happened in the past all the things that you might want to put in front of it, but then you must say to them in, in great love and humility, it's your decision because right. you are a being 
and once we, they reach the age of maturity, you, you, if you don't do that, then you're really not doing your job as a human being to another human being. Because what are you doing when you do that? You're respecting the other's autonomy, beingness, freedom. And they may say, you know what? You're right. Man. And, and when you get that back, you were right. Man, that feels good. You do want to, as a parent, uh, give your children uh, the benefit of your experience, but you have to give them primarily the um, uh, the uh, inheritance of freedom. And, and that's true of all of us. As, as we said earlier in, in the discussion, uh, our, our souls rebel against strictures. Uh, why? Because what we're really looking for is not just, quote unquote, um, the ability to do anything, anytime, anywhere. Yeah, that's nice but the consequences will catch up with you rather quickly. The key, the key is that in, in having freedom, we also have the, the, the ability to, um, uh, to discern and to uh, react and to use the ability to shift our perspective from the small to the larger to the, to the largest, to the vastest, and get to, you know, what, what Tolle says, which is get to the fact that, that you go beyond that which has been given to you. You go beyond the corporeal. You go beyond uh, the emotional. You go beyond the mental and realize that you encompass all those things. And then once you've encompassed them, once you've gotten in touch with the being that is you, the one that you left behind, when someone told you you should be doing something, uh, once you come back to that, before you come to the very end of your life, you can then live there. You can live in the being state and realize that all the other parts of you, which you were very comfortable in, were just stages. Um, one of the, the people that we used to watch long ago would say that as you grow, the nest becomes too small, you know, and you have to move on to the next thing. Well, as you grow from your childhood to your adulthood and, in, and into the various stages of, of experience and, and ideas and all these things, you realize that all of these the comfortable places are never meant to be the place that you, um, that you identify with. You don't identify with event, events. You don't identify with ideas. You don't identify with the corporeal. You realize that you encompass that you, the being, encompasses all these things and then you can do them all uh, I always equated um, this process with using a ladder mm. against the building and the ladder are the techniques or the principles that you basically are elevating yourself a step at a time and the whole idea is that once you get to the top of a ladder, you're supposed to climb off it and you're on the next level. But many times people want to cling to the ladder and not let go because it raised them up to that level, but they don't want to step off of the ladder. Mm. So you can equate the ladder with religion you can and habits that way. Mm. Um, a, a religious way of thinking is bring, building that structure. It's got to be this way. But you've got to understand that it's only a, a tool for your soul to elevate itself and onto the next part of your journey. And that's what I found fascinating is that people are clinging to this. Mm. Uh, and, and it can be almost any... Um, Anything that you can use to do that. You're, if you rely on your intellect alone, um, just climbing that way. Or emotions. How many friends do you have? Mm. You know, how many likes do I have? You're climbing up to this other level, but it's this is only a tool to elevate you. What do you do now? Do you have the courage to step it off of it? Right, and I think you, people identify with the ladder or with the rungs. Right. Yes. Each step became a comfortable place because it it, it supported you. It, it gave you certain benefits, gave you certain um, uh, rewards. You know, each step of every ladder 
what people say when you're advancing. You're climbing the ladder. Yes. But you get to the end of the ladder, and you've right. got to go higher, but it's not really higher. You've mm, got to, you, if there's another part of your journey, you've right. got to take the next step off of it. Right. Appreciating what it's done, because with every step on that ladder, if we're using the analogy, you have a higher perspective. You begin to see a little bit more and a little bit more as you elevate your eyes. But to understand that you were meant to go straight to the top. That is at the apex of where your existence is. You've got to let go. Yeah. I loved what you just said. That's the only reason I want to say is so you said appreciate the ladder. Yes, you, you give thanks for the ladder as you went along, and then you look back and say, gosh, that was such a great ladder. Because it got me here. But then you, you have to leave the training wheels behind, leave the ladders behind. Well, you, you understand that just as this ladder was a tool, mm there will be another tool to bring you from the level that you've just reached and climbed off of to the next. Some people will just want to bring the ladder up and to the next level and haul it all the way up there. <laughs> I'm taking this ladder with me. This thing's great. What are you talking about? You know, meanwhile, they're, they're, it's getting in the way of their wings, for argument's mm-hmm. sake. You know. Right, right. But the, it, it's understanding that these are our human tendencies. Yep. Comfortable again. Comfort comes into it. You're comfortable with the ladder. You understand every rung. Mm-hmm. You've, you've become acquainted with it, and mm-hmm. it's a tool that you know. But you are not taking into account that you are evolving into something more. Mm-hmm. And to know when to let go is one of the key things down here a skill to learn mm. when it's time to let go. And interestingly enough, if you know when to let go and you then act to let go, versus there, you know, regardless of what you wish, eventually you will be forced off the ladder. Right. And if, you, if you've identified yourself as the rungs or as the wood of the ladder, you're going to feel lost. Right. Right. So, but we well, are. You, but you, limit, you limited yourself at that point. But uh, I believe we have reached the end of our hour. No, I want to hold under the ladder. <laughs> so, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm Margaret. I'm Michael. And thank you for listening. <laughs>